A very good afternoon to all. Uh, welcome to the special session, an ecosystem approach for economic recovery in Southeast Asia. This, this is the ADB uh, Asia, Asian Development Bank um, project, and uh, it's a uh, uh, considering uh, this is a special session uh, to gather together all our experts today to discuss about the impact of uh, COVID pandemic and also the economy system uh, recovery approach. So without further ado, I would like to specially thanks our uh, Asian Development Bank for organizing the Southeast Asia Development Symposium since 2021. So this is a special session. The objective of this session is in partnership with the industry experts and nonprofit organization to discuss the opportunity that digital technology can bring for our economies and identify solutions to support SMEs and young people as they manage the economic impact posed by COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to also share with you the COVID-19 pandemic has brought disruptions in economic activities across ASEAN countries, including the decline in tourism, air travels, and consumer, as well as business confidence due to lockdowns, quarantines, business closures, and mobilization restrictions. By 7 March 2021, COVID-19 has infected more than 2 million people in Southeast Asia, has taken more than 50,000 lives, with Indonesia has the highest number of cases and death. As of September 2020, COVID-19 has caused more than 30 million people in ASEAN to become unemployed, pushing about 18 million people into poverty, and of which 3 million are in extreme poverty. So this is going to be the discussion today to see how best we can put in place our expertise with NGOs and partnerships with governments and the organization philanthropists to make this uh, recovery a better journey. So without further ado also, let me introduce myself. I'm actually Yang from ASEAN Foundation, the Executive Director of ASEAN Foundation. So it is my honor to be uh, the moderator for today's session. So let me actually introduce you to our uh, five uh, guests. Uh, Four uh, panel speakers, and one is our special guest for the opening. I uh, would like to introduce Ms. Tenzi Norbu, Director, Government Affairs and Public Policy, Southeast Asia Google. And we also have Ms. Maria Relic, Google Oc Lead Organization, uh, Google APEC. And we have uh, Mr. Cotton Hubbard, Technical Advisor, Youth and Economy Empowerment at Plan University, uh, uh, International USA. And we have Ms. Melanie Limburg, Country Representative, Cambodia, the Asia Foundation. And last but not least, Ms. Sumitra Pasupati, Global Partnerships Director for Asoka Innovators for the Public Limited Asoka Foundation. So I would like to first invite our Honorable Ms. Tenzi Norbu, Government Affairs and Public Policy Southeast Asia Google, to give us a opening uh, remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I'd really like to extend my very sincere gratitude and appreciation to the Asian Development Bank for hosting this important event. To our panelists and all participants, thank you very much for joining. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has really transformed the way businesses operate and has accelerated digital transformation across Southeast Asia. The recently launched uh, fifth edition of the e-economy Southeast Asia report that was undertaken by Google, Temasek Foundation and Bain surfaced some very interesting findings. We found that as of 2020, Southeast Asia's internet economy hit a hundred US billion dollars and is on track towards 310 billion US dollars in 2025. In the past year alone, there have been 40 million new internet users in Southeast Asia. More than one in every three digital service consumers is new to the service, and 90% of them indicate that they intend to stay online going forward, 
even after the pand pandemic. Vietnam and Indonesia's digital economies in particular have experienced double digit growth in 2020 and will likely do so going forward as well. This has driven massive and permanent growth in di the digital adoption of services. So clearly, the digital economy is key to economic recovery, and we need to ensure that everyone benefits from this transition to digital. Crucial to this are three things, investing in digital infrastructure, developing digital tools, and nurturing digital talent. First, in order to expand accessibility, affordability, and inclusiveness, we need to invest in digital infrastructure. In 2018, uh, Google had announced that we were expanding our global infrastructure with investments in new subsea cables, also known as submarine cables. Today, the Indigo and Japan Guam Australia South subsea cables are already in service boosting connectivity for the entire Asia Pacific region. Our network infrastructure investment of approximately $2 billion in this Asia Pacific region comprises six subsea cables. Second, we need to empower users with the right tools to leverage and use this digital infrastructure. So we continue to invest in improving our free tools that help businesses, particularly small businesses, transition online with ease. And a lot of this happened during the COVID year of 2020. So what does this mean? This really means, for example, that a local restaurant can keep posting photos of their menus, foods and drinks on Google My Business and keep in touch with their customers during these difficult pandemic times. And third, we need to nurture digital talent. As the role and adoption of technology in Southeast Asia grows, it is important to equip people with the knowledge and skills to securely navigate the digital economy with confidence too. Last year, we had identified six potential blockers to Southeast Asia's uh, potential, talent, internet access, payments, consumer trust, funding, and logistics. Of these six, Talent is the one area where the region has made the least progress, meaning expanding digital education and training is a critical priority, both for the recovery from COVID and for the region's long-term future. At Google, we have always understood that all the technology in the world cannot and will not be useful if people don't know how to use it. So for these efforts to be successful, we do need to take a wide view. At Google, we have been supporting startup founders and developers. We've been helping workers across many sectors reskill and upskill. And we've also been providing basic digital literacy across communities, including to disadvantaged groups. Let me just uh, cite an example of other things that we've been doing. In Indonesia and Bangladesh, for example, we're really assisting entry level job seekers to find both career and income opportunities through Google's Cormo Jobs app, especially in the logistics, services, and retail industries. We are working with more than 2,000 employers and have partnered with learning centers to provide online training to over a million registered job seekers. We also launched remote job listings, remote interview facilities to help support these job search during the pandemic lockdown in both countries. We are aware that we cannot do this alone and have been working with our partners to increase both the scale and reach of our efforts. We see that partnerships between governments, businesses, and the nonprofit sector are key to closing the skills gap and also expanding opportunity. But we can't lose the momentum that we gained in 2020 in the year going ahead in 2021. The urgency of responding to COVID-19 means we've seen fast, effective public-private sector collaboration on a scale like never before. Google has been privileged to collaborate on skilling programs across the region. Skills Ignition in Singapore, Vietnam Digital 4.0, Sapan Digital in Thailand, 
MSME caravan in the Philippines. These are all partnerships that have brought together government agencies and wide coalitions of businesses to help new graduates, mid-career workers, and business owners upskill and reskill and participate in the digital economy. In Indonesia, Google, major tech companies like Gojek, universities, and the government have partnered on Bangkit, a program that's designed to help develop young digital talent. From almost 2,500 applicants, 300 were selected to join the program in 2020. 73% of the original participants completed all the requirements to graduate. And within less than one month from completion of the program, 41 participants actually reported receiving a new job or internship directly as a result of their participation in the program. This is quite heartening to note. And after a successful first cohort, we just expanded the program for 2021. In addition, Google.org, our philanthropic arm, has provided funds to organizations who know the local community in our region well and serve disadvantaged populations. The Asia Foundation, Plan International, Ashoka, and ASEAN Foundation are some great examples of our partnerships. We share a desire to really help local businesses and communities succeed, enable the job market for youth, un youth employment, and really help unlock economic opportunities across ASEAN. So ladies and gentlemen, we think about Southeast Asia's digital economy future in fundamentally optimistic terms. This region could actually be the world. And why do we say that? First, in some sectors, Southeast Asia is already a global leader. E-commerce and delivery are the obvious examples. Second, Southeast Asia is young. The young population is influencing how people use the internet, which is almost entirely via mobile. Using voice, engaging with video and such, uh, as with other types of content. This will keep the region at the forefront of innovation. And third, Southeast Asia has an emerging cohort of, sub, of startups that are driven to solve big economic and social challenges. If we can help them develop their ideas, grow and scale, the potential is enormous. These are indeed challenging times, with social distancing measures in place and millions of people online, access to the open internet and access to digital skilling opportunities have become more essential than ever. To ensure sustainable recovery, we have to ensure that governments, the private sector, communities, and multilateral institutions can actually partner to shape the recovery from COVID-19, lay the necessary foundations for the long run, and ensure that the digital economy is inclusive. So in conclusion, I'd like to take this opportunity to once again thank ADB for hosting this event, all of our Google.org grantees, the Asia Foundation, Plan International, Ashoka and ASEAN Foundation for the great collaboration thus far. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating and I wish you a very productive session. Thank you, Tenzing, for the very inspiring and very, very good outlook on what ASEAN is about. So I'm very glad to say that uh, the high potential that we have, uh, we shouldn't actually just feel that we are insufficient. Uh? Actually, we can do more by all the partnerships. So the key actually to your presentations, which is partnerships is crucial uh, between NGOs, government and corporates. It's really what we are looking for in the future, how to drive the uh, next phase of development and recovery. So thank you very much for the great opening. And I, I truly wanted to uh, uh, open yeah, the uh, officially the panel discussions and presentation right after this, just to mention that uh, Ms. Tenzin will not be with us for the whole program. So there will be no questions uh, uh, directed to Ms. Tenzin. But of course, thanks for laying down the uh, good foundations for our discussion to start soon. Yeah? So uh, what I would like to actually invite our first uh, uh, speakers of the day and uh, the speakers were actually uh, Miss Melanie 
were actually uh, speaks on uh, SME and MSA uh, as uh, micro SMEs uh, sectors uh, support. So uh, as what all of you have been aware, SMEs and MSMEs are the heart of the Southeast Asia economy and many were amongst the most hit by the pandemic. So the question to Ms. Melanie is, uh, can you share more about the approaches you took while executing the Go Digital ASEAN initiative across 10 ASEAN countries? What were some of the challenges and what worked well? How can governments, the private sector, and other institution, uh, institutions work together to support the SMEs and MSMEs to keep their businesses afloat beyond the pandemic. So the floor is yours, uh, Ms. Melanie. Thank you, Dr. Yang. I appreciate this opportunity to present as part of this afternoon's very exciting panel on an ecosystem approach for economic recovery in Southeast Asia as part of the Asian Development Bank's uh, Southeast Asia Development Symposium. And a special thanks to Google and, and Google.org for inviting me to speak this afternoon. Um, to your question, I wanted to start out with a very high level overview of our interesting work we're doing called Go Digital ASEAN. This is an initiative that is designed to reach 200,000 MSMEs and underemployed youth across ASEAN and to equip them with basic digital literacy skills we're reaching underserved communities, women and peoples with disabilities in particular. And we're very delighted that this program has been endorsed by the ASEAN Secretariat through its micro and small enterprise uh, coordinating committee. First to the question related to approaches. Um, I'd like to share with the audience today, three approaches that we've been using to deliver our digital skills literacy across the region. The first approach reflects the importance and strength of partnership with local organizations who know the community best and are trusted, and they can reach underserved communities and deliver training in a very effective manner. Our second approach was, as we were developing the program, to look for developing tailored curriculum that have been based on needs assessments that we did at the start to ensure that what we are delivering is locally relevant and accessible and customized to the local context. It's important to remember that the majority of trainees we're working with are using their smartphones exclusively for communication and entertainment, and they're not writing professional emails or keeping detailed accounting spreadsheets. In addition, simplifying our training to be mobile friendly in local and approachable language and geared toward the casual internet users suddenly opens a huge door for the more than 40 million people that were just mentioned by Tenzing who have just come online in the past year. Our third approach has been in developing a holistic training strategy, which for us really means thinking through when it may be best to deliver training, how we should differentiate and adapt to local needs and circumstances. So for example, for an MSME owner, it's not just about providing a training on how to use an e-commerce app, but it's about why it is important for their business. And it's also about how to use that e-commerce app safely. We find that trust is a huge reason why many people are very uh, not, not able to use many of the online payment tools, for example, but and, and this is really the, the, the challenge that they face as opposed to their lack of know-how. If I take another example of say, working with women entrepreneurs, it may be about showing up at a trainee's home so that they don't have to worry about childcare or staying that extra hour to explain the value of the training to the trainee's husband. So that he allows her to participate in the training in the first place. So these are just a few of the approaches I wanted to very briefly highlight this afternoon. To your second question, um, in terms of what we're seeing uh, related to challenges and what's working well, um, I think clearly COVID-19 has required Go Digital ASEAN to pivot. And we've had to pivot to a hybrid online learning model across the region. We initially developed the program anticipating that we could use more face-to-face -face delivery approaches, which in many, many places, as we well know, are no longer viable. 
So while COVID-19 has presented enormous challenges, it has also heightened the need to make digital skills accessible, and it's all the more important for those communities which we are working in. Go Digital ASEAN has sought to engage using an inclusive approach, reaching out in particular to those just coming online who have, who, or who have been um, limited in their access to the, some of the training opportunities, perhaps, for example, people living in urban settings, since we are focusing a lot on underserved communities and rural areas. It's been really important for us to think through this with our partners, what those issues are, what it means for people who are coming online, and how to make this training as effective and meaningful as possible. We found that flexibility and adaptability has been absolutely key. For example, we learned that video-based content for trainees who may not have had some of these access uh, in the past and may be bogged down with, with heavy um, text-based learning tools, for example, has been particularly helpful. It's also helped trainees who wanna go back to look at training materials after a formal lesson and also be able to learn things at their own pace. So these are just a couple of the challenges and areas that we're finding um, at this point of, of project. Uh, and finally, let me respond briefly to how governments, private sector and other institutions can work together to support MSMEs to keep their businesses afloat beyond the pandemic. You know, Working together and constructively is really crucial. Governments, private sectors, uh, development actors like ourselves uh, in the NGO world, we all have a lot to offer these MSMEs and small businesses. More specifically, we found that cross-cutting partnerships pave the path for scalable solutions that leaves no one behind and encourage collective learning across the region Second, these connections have also played out at the policy level, where we can ensure that policies that are being considered and created are informed by learnings and the realities from trainings in rural Brunei or Laos or Vietnam. Finally, both private sector and, um, I, I think this is certainly important to note here, they are able to amplify the profile and media reach of a project like this and regional government partnerships like the one I mentioned with ASEAN help to increase the scale, influence, and legacy of the project. And they help Go Digital ASEAN reach those small businesses interested in acquiring new skills to grow their very own businesses. So with that, thank you very much for this opportunity to share some ideas and thoughts. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Uh, this is a great sharing. Eh? I mean that uh, there are three approaches that you have taken. Of course, uh, it is tough uh, uh, to really go down and convince uh, the people that uh, you need uh, technology, you need to be in the e-commerce and you need to be digital. Uh, because previously, we have been trying to do it so many years and it's not successful. But I think uh, we, we can leverage on the pandemic situations uh, to make it happen this time. So I hope that uh, your journey will be an easy one later. Uh. So we will further discuss about uh, your topics uh, after this. So I uh, just want to uh, inform all the audience uh, participants to go to the box. Uh, there's a box underneath the screen there and put your questions and direct it to which speaker. I mean, we already have Melanie just now sharing with us. So you can always share, uh, ask the questions starting from now and we will compile and collect the questions. And all these questions can be uh, submitted and discussed later at the end of all the presentations. So uh, please uh, feel free to ask the questions. So now uh, we are going to our session two. Our session two is uh, we're going to have um, another speaker, uh, Colton, uh, to share with us his uh, project later. So based on the International Labour Organization, uh, ILO, 255 million jobs were lost globally in 2020, 140 million of which were from APEC. A staggering 55% of the world's losses is actually in APEC. So in East Asia and the Pacific, COVID-19 has caused an additional 38 million of new poor, making up a total of 570 million now living below the poverty line. 
according this is according to the world bank report so for cotton maybe i want to ask you one thing can you share more about your learnings in indonesia because i think indonesia among the asean countries the most biggest one get hit and affected by pandemic so the bridges to the future initiative in partnership with my organization asean foundation and also a partnership with corporate and government stakeholders. Perhaps you could actually highlight some of this and uh, share with us your knowledge about this project. Thank you. The floor is yours, Cotton. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang. Uh, and thank you to Google for the invitation to be here to speak today at Seeds. Thank you, of course, to ADB for organizing this important opportunity to exchange about this issue. Um, I'll, I'll present very briefly about the Bridge to the Future project, which of course Google is supporting in Indonesia, as Dr. Yang mentioned. And for those of you not familiar with PLAN, we are um, an 80-year-old global organization, and we focus on advancing children's rights and equality for women and girls. Last year, we were in 75 countries and reached over 50 million children. And in Indonesia, we've been around since 1969, working in the areas of girls' rights and youth and economic empowerment, sexual and reproductive health and other areas. And since 2017, we're actually, uh, we have the status of a local foundation. So as Dr. Yang mentioned, uh, we are implementing the Bridge to the Future uh, program in collaboration with the ASEAN Foundation. Uh, and we're building on our prior experience in country and really responding to the challenging youth employment situation in Indonesia and elsewhere that others have been speaking about, which has of course been complicated and, and opened up by COVID-19. Uh, this is a two year pilot program, which we've, we've just started in Q4 of 2020. So we're just beginning to, to have some learnings and activities, but by the end of the program, we aim to reach 10,000 unemployed and vulnerable young people aged 18 to 29. And we have a heavy focus on reaching young women uh, with training and job placement support to help them become equipped and connected to the world of work, um, mostly for the first time. Uh, so as others have been mentioning, why, why now? It seems obvious because COVID-19 has been hugely disruptive and it has introduced a lot of threats that we're familiar with hearing about by now, um, the negative impacts on jobs and businesses and investment, increases in, in unemployment, especially for youth and industries that employ youth. Uh, there's also a persistently wide gender gap um, in Indonesia in the labor force participation rate. It's about 75 versus 50. 75% uh, for men versus 50 for women. And this has also increased, um, alluding to the fact that the um, COVID is affecting different communities um, disproportionately. And we're also seeing growth in stress and negative emotional health, things like isolation and anger. Um, but having said that, there are a number of opportunities. Um, as Ms. Norbu was speaking, about there's huge increases in adoption of online methodologies, uh, education institutes and employers have had to transfer teaching and training and mentoring online uh, very quickly. The internet, internet usage rates have skyrocketed. Um, and even though some sectors are downturning, others are growing like e-commerce and ICT. And these have um, are projected to have a lot of especially entry-level opportunities for young people. Um, uh, so we see some entry points for, for young people, but to take advantage of this, we really need good upskilling or reskilling. We need opportunities for young people to have facilitated connections with the labor market. Um, and when these opportunities are uh, high quality, market relevant and youth appropriate, they can really uh, help people, young people take advantage of the disruption and gain skills that not only help them um, be adaptive and resilient now, but into the future. Uh, and to do that, we need to, of course, work very closely with TVET systems and close the skills gap 
um, between youth qualifications and employer demand. So having said that, uh, I'll, I'll sort of talk about the four approaches we're using for uh, the Bridge to the Future program. One, of course, is, is research and assessment, which the ASEAN Foundation is, is leading and providing expertise and partnership. We're starting with a 10 country uh, labor market study of countries in the ASEAN region as we continue to come out of COVID. And this is from a youth-centered perspective. So we're looking at things like how have, um, what's, how have the demand for skills changed and how have the barriers for vulnerable job seekers in particular um, developed or changed? Uh, what kinds of new opportunities are there? Uh, what are the specific soft skills requirements for these new opportunities? And very importantly, how can digital tools and content be increasingly leveraged? Um, we're, we're working uh, with partner engagement and capacity in Indonesia. We're leveraging these relationships which PLAN and ASEAN Foundation have built through uh, their long history in, in programming. And these are relationships with many of the relevant institutions in government and industry, such as the Ministry of Manpower, uh, the Indonesia Employers Association, um, and the LK Vocational Training Institute, which will be a key partner in reaching young people. And our focus in the Bridge to the Future program is improving the ability of the training institutes to offer more effective trainings and support for youth, um, more up-to-date methods, content, and pedagogy. And we're, we're going to be using tailored organizational capacity assessment, um, cascading training models, such as training of trainers that um, build in-house capacity, um, and then of course, ongoing technical support. But then our real focus is reaching youth with the improved training and support methods. Um, this will be focused on updating not only the technical and vocational curricula to be more based on those practical competencies um, that are aligned with the current market. Um, of course, drawing on our assessment data, employer input and advice, uh, which I'll get to next, uh, but also ensuring that the training is adequately including and addressing the need for various buckets of soft skills. Um, these can be professional upskilling, um, like workplace ethics, how to search for jobs and uh, create resumes. Um, also key skills like financial literacy, how to manage um, finances, um, gender dynamics and, and issues of equity and rights at work. Um, and we're going to be doing this using blended learning methods that incorporate digital methods and by doing so build those key digital literacy skills that are uh, so important now and will just continue to be even more important. This is going to be leveraging plans, own tools, and of course, taking advantage of uh, Google's expertise and tools such as Cormo, which have been mentioned, um, and developing um, tailored responses to the needs that we're seeing. Um, and we're also promoting the integration of other kinds of support for young people, such as psychosocial support, um, having referral organizations, referral um, relationships with other organizations for other kinds of support, offering young people career guidance that is relevant to them, that exposes them to new career pathways, um, peer to peer mentorship, um, and promoting improvement of certification and accreditation with that youth training. And then, very importantly, this all rests on. Um, more opportunities for the private sector to be engaged and connected with TVETs. We're providing oversight about curriculum, improving cooperation around sharing materials and resources with training institutes, um, and creating new work-based learning opportunities for youth, such as internships, that can give young people practical uh, experience and pathways to, to be integrated into the labor market. Um, and of course, we're going to be tapping our existing relationships with a variety of key private sector actors in Indonesia. And, and I'll, I'll end with sort of three core concepts that 
are guiding our programming approach. One is um, the youth um, being youth-centered. So we're, we're, in, we're taking advantage of what we call a positive youth development approach that is focused on um, leveraging the assets or strengths that youth are already coming to the table with, um, introducing them to opportunities that are um, relevant and interesting to them in career pathways that are um, interesting and feasible for them, and using what we call meaningful youth engagement techniques to bring them into uh, the program and the conversation, ensure they have a voice, a choice, um, and this can also help them develop other supportive relationships with, with each other, with their peers, and with their coaches. Another core concept is inclusivity, as, as others have um, continued to mention. Um, many of the threats presented by COVID are exacerbated for groups and demographics that are already less well positioned in the labor market. So we're focusing on how we can reach and include them by specific targets, participation support methods um, to help them access program programming and, and do so effectively, and to meet them where they are, looking at issues of internet accessibility, um, skills and education, geography, and more. And also, um, we're going to be future oriented, meaning that while uh, being market driven, we're focusing on the building the skills and skill types that will build youth resiliency, not only now, but in the future. These are things like critical thinking and information synthesis, good digital habits, uh, how to deal with growing uh, misinformation and, and fake news online. Um, and responsible social media use. So um, with that, uh, I will close and um, take any questions that are available and I'm happy to, to respond to um, additional questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Thank you, uh, Cotton. Uh, I know that I'm aware that Cotton, you have more than 12 years experience uh, in skill development for young people. So I'm sure the programs will be, you know, will be uh, in a good hand. Uh? Of you. So I'm also wanted to stress that upskill, reskill uh, is really important uh, for because most of the young people right now, maybe whatever they have before the skill might not be able to be used fully at this time. So it is important to upskill and reskill. And then also uh, in terms of scaling, I think that uh, the focus of the program is also to look into technical and also cognitive skills. Uh, because uh, not only technical, uh, because many people thought that once they knew how to use uh, the technical stuff, they can do it well. You know, it's not really that direct. You know, so it is good to actually participate and uh, sign up uh, for the programs because I think the program has been launched uh, for uh, application. So I do hope that uh, the public and audience uh, can uh, uh, participate in some of our programs that have been launched through this partnership with Cotton Site. Uh. So uh, I'm now going to the uh, last sessions of today, which uh, in these sessions, we have uh, uh, two speakers. Uh, we are going uh, to go for first one by one. But before I proceed with the session three, may I remind you again to uh, send your questions to uh, Cotton uh, at the box, and we will be uh, summarizing the questions. Uh, then I can read out the questions after all the panel uh, finish their presentation. So far, I already have a few questions here, but I will not post it uh, for Melanie yeah, earlier. And then I hope that we will get questions also for Cotton very soon. So uh, for this uh, third session, uh, we're talking about technology. Yeah? So technology is a powerful force. And we have seen social entrepreneurs and nonprofit around the world leveraging technology in inventive ways to serve, to solve urgent problems, bridge gaps, and create more eco societies. Although at the same time, many organizations do not know how to leverage technology to drive impact, engage employees and volunteers and innovate for change, but uh, it is undeniable, eh? it is important, even though we don't know, but we have to learn. Eh? So uh, with support from Google Org, Asoka has brought together 28 social impact organizations from India, Indonesia and Singapore on a capacity building journey to strengthen their social impact in the short term, particularly during this pandemic time and longer term also. 
So the delivery of the technology and measurement of evidence, and we call it M and E yeah, in NGOs uh, terms, these modules of the program was designed and delivered in partnership with Info Exchange and Satwa Consulting. So I would like to call, uh, invite our first speaker uh, in uh, panel for this uh, session three, Ms. Sumitra. Uh, Sumitra, yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you, can you tell us more about Asoka's capacity building initiative and what are some of the insights and learnings? Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Sumitra. Hi, thank you very much, Dr. Yang. Uh, and I'd like to thank ADB and the SEED uh, for this platform and Google.org and Maria for this very kind invitation. Um, I wanted to say good afternoon to everyone in ASEAN, uh, my fellow countrymen. Uh, great to be here. And to answer your question, Dr. Yang, I'd like to invite us to take a step back. It's been really exciting to hear the work of PLAN and Asia Foundation in terms of driving change. Um, Ashoka focuses very specifically and its roots and origins very deeply in the region. We launched actually 40 years ago, first in India and then in Indonesia and then Thailand. Um, so the region is very, very important for us in terms of driving innovation and creating more solutions uh, for change. So before I answer your question, I'd love for us to take a step back and watch a video. Uh, and can I invite Ed uh, to play the video for us, please? Thank you. Thank you for that. So what what we need in the future starts now. And that is why this support from Google.org, uh, which supports the partnership of Ashoka, uh, Info Exchange and Sattva to deliver a capacity building program for 28 social impact organizations in India, Indonesia and Singapore was very timely and very much needed. Um, we are living in a world of incredible change and, and complexity. I think the last 14 months demonstrated to us that we needed to respond fast and we needed to create new solutions, very different solutions which are driven by change makers and social entrepreneurs. So what do social entrepreneurs do? They are deeply embedded in society. They are largely the part of society. And they do three things. One, they drive structural and systemic change with a commitment to solve problems. They, need, they create new connections and interconnections between all actors of society in solving problems. And we need civil society to be at the table to solving problems together with policymakers, business leaders, other change, and other change makers. This is why being part of this summit and conference has been incredibly important to social entrepreneurs. And thirdly, social entrepreneurs and change makers in their models are looking to empower others 
and other organizations to drive more change. And this creates indirect impact that drives larger scale change. So when COVID-19 unfolded, this program became very, very timely and important. Um, we, of course, planned uh, offline and online sophisticated interaction. Uh, however, we were delighted with the partnership with Google. We learned to get digital very, very quickly. And the, and the program transformed into a six month journey online. It supported 28 system changing social entrepreneurs in India, Indonesia and Singapore. 23 of these organizations reach millions of children across these three countries. And, the, and in, through the program, we achieved three things. One is many of these organizations not only responded to their day-to-day -day crisis that they were confronted uh, on the ground, they did take the opportunity and the time to strengthen and deepen the articulation of system change and scaling impact initiatives. They also took the opportunity to deepen their technology insights with our technology partner in Forex Exchange. And now more than ever, they saw the importance of measuring impact and through our partners, Sadba. We also, through the program, not only invo involved the founders, but also the team members and the next generation leaders of these organizations. And this provided much needed courage and resilience for these organizations to drive um, to achieve impact and to drive impact. Many of our organizations themselves underwent COVID or experienced COVID themselves. Um, while many other organizations, like the ones in India, had direct opportunity to work with government and through the learning journey that they explored with us, they deepened their impact with government. So the first thing is we strengthened the organization uh, over the last six months. The second thing is we connected and provided more actors into the ecosystem of social entrepreneurs to support their development and their transition. And this was through our volunteer program, which involved 30 volunteers from Google, Carney, and Accenture, who provided regular mentoring session. While the commitment was five sessions, we, many volunteers are still um, maintaining their relationships with these organizations. This culminated with a high level knowledge sharing, peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange with technology leaders, leaders of philanthropic organizations and consulting firms. And we had a summit with over a thousand viewers in the region for these social entrepreneurs to inspire others with their models and to allow for further replication. So we've strengthened organizations, we've connected them. And now what we're beginning to see thirdly is greater collaboration to create impact between the 20, uh, 28 social entrepreneurs in our community. Um, it's really interesting, Colton, that you talked about uh, digital safety and hoax. And two of our social entrepreneurs, um, Diana Haryana from Sajiva and Dr. Park from DQ Institute are embarking on a journey in Indonesia to drive digital change making and citizenship. Dr. Park has an ambitious mission to reach a billion children, and she can only do that through collaboration. So this work enabled us to create more ecosystemic support as well as more collaborations. So where are we going next? A key part of this work, as, as we just saw from the video, the future is happening now. We took the time to really understand from civil society across Southeast Asia, on the role of technology and the future outlook. We are delighted to announce that we're releasing this innovation report today here at this summit with the support of google.org. And the report will be shared in our social media and I just shared the link in the chat as well for you to to have a look at the, at the key insights. It's a long read, so I'll give you the top line. Uh, the key insights in terms of the needs for social entrepreneurs are the following. One, we need to continue to build an ecosystem of support that we've started, and we need to have equal voice of social entrepreneurs in that ecosystem. Social entrepreneurs do need more support, access to networks and partnerships, 
particularly in the following three groups, international foundations, government and policymakers, and corporations, and a growing need from technology corporations. Underscoring all of this is while we strengthen this as ecosystemic approach, we need social entrepreneurs need more access to decision, decision makers upstream in the design of solutions. The second thing is we need more social entrepreneurs need more flexible investments for greater impact. Um, more flexible funding to create systemic impact. It's complex, it's changing, and it's emerging every day. To build organizational capacity and capabilities with robust governance structures. I mean, this was a very striking need across many of the organizations across ASEAN in terms of building organizational capacity and, 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 and development. And we need to go beyond financial support to provide more two-way, three-way learning exchanges to build an ecosystem of support as equal partners to strengthen these organizations. The, the third insight from the report is that we all broadly recognize that technology can accelerate the good and the bad. And therefore, we need to see social entrepreneurs in the conversation as real-time R&D experts to support and develop design principles that will create more fair and just future for all. So we do need more transparency and accountability and the voice of the citizen sector can be powerful in the development of policy to raise both the unintended consequences of technology, but also very quickly provide the solutions. Just like the example of Diana Haryana and Dr. Park, who are rolling out a large digital uh, safety framework and digital citizenship framework across Indonesia. And we, so, so, that, so that's, that's one point around transparency and accountability. The second point is as the world moves at an accelerated pace, we, at Ashoka, we believe that everyone needs to participate in solving problems and creating solutions. And we think and we see that technology can be really powerful in unleashing the power of every single person to create solutions. And the top three areas of social change, which we see in the report is improving access to young, old and rural communities and marginalized communities, allowing for agency for everyone to participate and to take charge and to solve problems and to allow for more cross-sector collaborations. Lastly, we need better infrastructure to improve access and reduce inequality and create more relevant solutions for communities in the last mile. The report reveals that community creation offline matters as much as online adoption and usage. The strength and use of technology for fundraising and resource raising and the use of technology for real-time measurements of impact and to create nudges to drive systems change and behavioral change and ultimately generate positive social outcome for society. So I will end with the five recommended steps from the report uh, before I hand it over to Maria. The report invites us, um, based on the conversations with over 100 social entrepreneurs, to do five things. One, to invest more deeply in people and social innovation that maximizes human potential. Two, to create digital governance frameworks that draws from the wisdom of social entrepreneurs. And this is a clear invitation to policymakers in all our ASEAN countries. Three, to invest in community assets offline and, di and digitally connect for all. Four, increase partnerships with social entrepreneurs for a fairer and equitable market for all. And lastly, leverage technology for measurements and real nudges for systemic impact. Thank you again um, to google.org for their support in this program, as well as our partners in Exchange and Sadbar. Um, we've really enjoyed the program and this session so far. Thank you for listening and look forward to the Q&A session. Over to you, Dr. Yang. Thank you, Sumitra. Uh, it is very crucial. I actually agree with you that the um, 
uh, transparency yeah, and accountability is really the crucial things for NGOs and also for the uh, partnerships to uh, continue for long term. Huh? That means sustainable. If, uh, if the organization couldn't uh, come up with the good uh, accountability and transparency, there might be issues to uh, proceed and continue the relationship. Huh? So uh, the skill that you have provided and the training uh, through your programs is really crucial. And I think most of the NGOs and CSOs uh, need to actually master the skill for future. So this is also based on the experience that we have uh, from our foundation. So uh, uh, I would like to actually invite our last speaker of today, which is uh, Maria. Uh, Maria is from uh, Google Org. Eh? And, uh, uh, Google Org has been supporting a uh, social impact organization with the best resources of Google. So can you share more about Google Org's approach to philanthropy, especially during a pandemic time? So the floor is yours, Maria. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang and, and the Asia, Asian Development Bank. It's a, it's a really true pleasure to be here today and to learn and, and share with our fe fellow panelists. Let me start by saying that we know that last year has been particularly challenging for, for many people. Uh, we also heard from our panelists that the pandemic has led businesses and youth in Southeast Asia and worldwide severely impacted. And on top of that, we've also seen how many of the social impact organizations had to pivot their initiatives from and move them from offline to online delivery due to the pandemic. Our vision at Google.org, which is Google's philanthropy, is simple. It's to have the positive impact on the world. And we really work hard to stay true to this by focusing our efforts through three main effort, uh, resources. The first one, funding, second one, technology, and the third one, volunteers. We live in a world uh, that is full of new opportunities. Um, you hear about biotechnology, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, internet of things, etc. And just before we heard from Tenzin that 40 million people came online in Southeast Asia just last year. 70% of the region's population is now online. And those people will be able to access many opportunities. And while that's amazing, we also know that for many people, some of these opportunities will remain out of reach. And especially for those who are the most marginalized communities um, and, in underserved, and underserved people. So here's an interesting fact. Uh, the World Economic Forum predicts that 50% of current employees, that's half of us, uh, we'll need to learn new skills by year 2025 as the adoption of technology increases. Skills like critical thinking and problem solving top the list. Employers believe that these skills will grow in prominence in the next five years. And emerging skills on the other hand, this year include self-management such as active learning, resilience, stress, tolerance, and flexibility. Responders to the Future of Jobs survey estimates that around four in 10 workers will require reskilling in the next couple of months. Again, for many people, learning new skills remain out of reach and a challenge. Yet we have to be reminded that big challenges often bring big opportunities. And if there is one thing that I've seen from this unprecedented outbreak, it's the resilience and creativity of organizations, businesses, and individuals across Asia Pacific, especially Southeast Asia. For many, for many of us, we had to experiment and figure out how to best pivot the way we work and be productive and connected with one another. At google.org, we know that the best answers come from those who are closest to the problem. And that is why we rely on our grantees, the ASEAN Foundation, the Asia Foundation, Plan International, Ashoka, are, who are the experts on the ground. And that's why when the pandemic hit, 
we reach out to these organizations to ask them how we can learn from their experiences about the challenges that these marginalized people are facing and how we can be most helpful. We shifted most of our efforts and dedicated $100 million um, last year to focus on areas where we can have the biggest impact and where we can be the most helpful, like in areas such as economic recovery. As Melanie and, and Colton shared, a small business, youth and small businesses are the heart of Southeast Asia economy and community. But many of these SMEs and MSMEs have been hard hit by the, by the outbreak. These SMEs are contributing to more than 80% of the workforce and more than 50% of the region's GDP. Yet the current outbreak has left many of these businesses in a vulnerable situations and especially those in the most vulnerable and underserved communities. We believe that working towards a skills-led economic recovery plan is crucial to helping these SMEs rebuild and get through this crisis. New jobs will be created and, and young people should be able to access these new skills to remain valuable for the labor market. This will take really all of us to working together to ensure that re the recovery is quick, comprehensive and equitable for all. Good example is Go Digital ASEAN, the initiative that is driven by the Asia Foundation with their implement local implementing partners across 10 ASEAN countries. The initiative was supported by us, by Google.org, and also endorsed by the ASEAN Secretariat. I was personally inspired by the resilience of our grantees and how quickly they managed to pivot their initiatives while learning new skills. As Sumitra shared, some of the, many of these social impact organizations are really are eager to learn new skills, including how to use uh, different te technology or different digital tools online. And as someone who was previously in the nonprofit world, I understand that finding these right resources, talent and tools can be a challenge. And this current pandemic really doesn't make it easier. And that is why we saw the opportunity to support Ashoka's capacity building initiative um, to support and train and build capacities of 28 social impact organizations from Singapore, Indonesia and India. We see great potential in capacity building. And as Sumitra talked about, uh, not only because it provides nonprofit leaders with relevant knowledge so they can address some of these challenges, and at the same time, they can sustain and scale their efforts in their communities for the long term. But also more than that, we wanted to build a program where various organizations can come together as a community to learn from one another, collaborate, and discover new ideas together. Enabling organizations with technology and connecting them with volunteers is a huge part of our philanthropic approach. Technology can be a powerful part of solution to a COVID recovery. I've seen how technology uh, combined with technical expertise can play such a critical role, and especially in this time of crisis. As I mentioned earlier, we always try to complement our funds with our Googlers. Um, we are always looking to engage volunteers to support our grantees with men mentorship and training for a variety of different reasons. And over the last year, we've seen how our employees actively volunteering and mentoring these entrepreneurs and business owners to help them learn new skills um, or simply just explore new ways uh, how to use different digital tools online. Googlers have, cho have the choice of volunteering their skills um, and time on a short or a long-term basis. So for example, on the short-term basis, we had volunteers across APAC who volunteered their skills and time um, to mentor some of the social impact organizations, participants of uh, the Ashoka Capacity Building Initiative. But also in the long term, we have launched Google.org Fellowship, 
our flagship volunteering program, where our employees spend up to six months full time working with nonprofits on their toughest challenges. And just last year, we launched our pilot fellowship in Asia with Vadvani AI in India. Vadvani AI set out to address the destruction of crops uh, through an AI, artificial intelligence based tool, that allows small scale farmers to manage pests. Initially, we supported this organization with a $2 million uh, US dollars grant as part of our AI impact challenge. And as part as their team um, hit the ground running, they needed support. So bringing two out of three uh, resources from google.org, um, we uh, also supported them with nine google.org uh, fellows to help full time for six months to increase the accuracy and scale out the model. This is just one of the examples uh, where we have seen promising technologies like artificial intelligence to provide new solutions that can dramatically improve our lives. The pandemic caused us to increase also our support um, in economic recovery and we'll, we'll continue to support organizations in, in this area. Something that I'm really personally proud of and that I want to share with you is that earlier this month in India, we announced um, a Google.org impact challenge to provide 25 million in grants to nonprofits and social Im impact organizations around the globe, creating pathways to prosperity for women and girls. Through this open call, we'll support projects that empower women and girls to reach their full potential and thrive. And if you're part of this organization serving women and girls, we would encourage you to apply before April 10th. So before we play you the video, I want to thank you again for having me and for holding these important conversations. We are so grateful to be doing this work with you. Thank you so much. What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? It means innovating, risk-taking, and communicating, changing the world one business at a time. Entrepreneurship has power, but that power isn't shared equally. Today, only one in three businesses are owned by women. Almost universally, women face the same barriers. As a woman, it's been sometimes quite difficult to be taken seriously. When you become a mom, people think that you can only uh, take care of your family. Capita spesso che una donna in un ambiente professionale venga svalutata o che il suo lavoro non venga preso sul serio. Ebong amader samaj ekhono porjonto kono meye giye baire uddokta hobe ba chakri korbe etar jonno ashole ekhono porjonto prostut na. In 2020, the situation got worse. Nyomien sa kha hang ko fai nyomoi nos tong min chai nang. Chai no pe dai covid chau ma dal ku nyom bat bang ate chon nyom ahali. Covid er karon e jehutu lockdown hoye galu. Ebang amake office bondhu kore dite hoy chilo. Jar jono staff der ke chire dite hoy chilo. Tana arai ma office ta bondhu rakte hoy chilo. By working with our partners. Youth Business International have supported women entrepreneurs in 31 countries to recover from and respond to the COVID-19 crisis. We were able to strategize and plan for our 2021 goals. They've given us opportunities, me and my team, to attend workshops, consult with experts. E attraverso questo programma con Marco Barbieri, che è il mio mentor, ho imparato a uh, guardare me stessa come un'imprenditrice e a gestire la mia azienda in un modo migliore e soprattutto più efficace. 16,000 women have received crucial support through webinars, mentoring, coaching and business clinics. And we've reached thousands more through outreach, helplines and microsites. Over 90% of participants have increased their technical business skills so they can stay strong and carry on changing the world one business at a time. I think that the future of women in business is bright. I feel that there are opportunities now that were not available before. 
The future of a women-led business is more diversity of thoughts, more innovation and more opportunity for women in future generations. This Women's Entrepreneurship Day, let's celebrate the brave, bold and brilliant women who dare to be their own boss. So much. Thank you so much. Uh, we are back again. Uh, thank you to all the panels for your great sharing. So uh, we are having four. We have four presentations uh, that open for questions and answer. So uh, Maria just presented about Google Ox uh, initiatives and then inclusive approach. Uh, this is really I would like to thank you on behalf uh, of everyone here and the uh, partners. Uh, for initiating this kind of approach, uh, because I can see that you target for uh, SMEs, you target for youth, and also you target for marginalized group, uh, which is the women. Uh. So uh, I would like to open floors for further questions. But we, our questions and answer team is already uh, has already compiled one or two questions. So we are going to start with the first question for Melanie, perhaps. Uh, Melanie, you let me know if this is your questions. <laughs> But I think this is for you because it was asked after your session. For tourism sector, can you recommend an effective strategy for the recoveries for the emerging tourism test destinations, which are now pending for development? Because uh, the, uh, the author, the, the participants think that the government is now focused on funding healthcare sector because of the rising cases of the virus. So what about uh, tourism, which is badly affected? So what is your uh, suggestion, huh, Melanie? Uh, thanks so much for that. Very good question. Um, I think we can all say that across um, ASEAN, um, tourism has been uh, disproportionately affected. Um, here in Cambodia, I know it's, it's been very, very challenging, particularly for those micro and small enterprises that uh, contribute so much to uh, the incredible tourism sector uh, in many countries here. I think one of the things that we've seen through our Go Digital ASEAN project is that um, we, I think one strategy has been for MSMEs to start focusing on the domestic marketplace. Um, we've had uh, cases, for example, here in Cambodia where there's been a lot more opportunities to travel domestically, um, but not across borders. And so how to realign businesses for domestic tourists and, and what to do in that, that sense. Um, we've also had um, a number of trainees in our programs, for example, who joined and they were in the tourism sector and then through training have actually switched and adapted. So we had, for example, a tour guide in uh, Northern Thailand near Chiang Mai. And um, he, when tourism went flat, he completely changed over uh, based on some of the skills that he developed through our training program on Go Digital um, on how to be a, an online uh, seller through learning about e-commerce apps. So he's now uh, selling vitamin supplements um, in, in, um, in that area. Um, I also think that there are some incredibly interesting ideas that are, that are coming out of the pandemic, some really great innovators, entrepreneurs, um, startups, who really come out with ideas on how to help connect some of those handicraft makers, for example, in tourist destinations to online marketplaces to enable them to continue uh, staying in business um, at these really challenging times, and particularly to connect them to urban um, sector um, you know, folks. Um, we've also seen that, for example, uh, as well, another example from Thailand, that in our curriculums in Thailand, we have an online video which features a story of an indigenous entrepreneur. She's from rural Thailand. She sells traditional woven products, but she's focusing on how to uh, get those customers in Bangkok and other parts of the country now to take notice of her, her fine uh, products. So I think we've seen these things happen uh, throughout the region. These are just a couple of small examples to date. Uh, but I think, again, um, being adaptable and adjusting to the realities has been critically important. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Melanie, for the good suggestions. Actually, the, uh, you're right that uh, they have to be flexible and able to change because a lot of things has changed. So I do hope that uh, the advice can be uh, accepted and uh, received well by most of the participants here to change. So uh, the second question is actually uh, directed to Cotton. What are the methods to reach young people in the grassroots who have a hard time transitioning to digital learning because of their current conditions 
which is poor internet connection and no cell phone or laptops. So uh, perhaps uh, you can actually give a good suggestion, Cotton. Sure, thanks for that question, Dr. Yang. Uh, and it's incredibly relevant. Um, given that we're at an early stage under this program, um, we're going to be building on methods that have been successful in other workforce development programming in, in Indonesia. And it's helpful to think about this in terms of, are we talking about no access or low access? So when we're talking about no access, of course, there's a rule, there's a rule for um, direct material support. This is program support for um, purchasing phone cards or cell phones or laptops themselves, um, subsidizing connection to the internet. If that is, um, if, if there's really no access and you're using a digital tool, or things like um, mobile um, uh, uh, sort of buses, internet buses, which can help um, young people connect um, in places where there's just no access at all or organize young people into groups um, that can take advantage of one source of internet connection. But when we're talking about low access, um, we've had a, a lot of support working around this because this is this is the situation in, in many of our programs. Um, so this is things like taking advantage of lower bandwidth um, uh, methods to reach young people based on SMS, using WhatsApp, um, using asynchronous learning where some of the activities are completed offline and then connection happens at a, at a specific point. Um, looking at alternating class hours to be more accessible. Um, maybe there's a case where families are using one device and, and can only access it in, at a certain time. Um, and then also um, looking at the quality of interaction, uh, digital interaction when it's happening. Um, this, is, this can be especially important for young people with disabilities who may have learning or, or visual or hearing disabilities. So the program can put in place extra supports to, uh, to help address that. So it's going to be a variety of methods um, that will be more successful there. Uh, thank you, Cotton. Uh, seems like uh, your suggestions also uh, cannot deny the importance of uh, on the ground activity. Yeah? So I suppose this part of it, we can work with the local uh, partners uh, who understand better the schedule of the people. Yes, absolutely. Taking advantage of the local partnerships. And in many cases, there are those existing um, outreach efforts to, to um, low access communities that we can leverage. Thank you. Uh, thank you for answering the questions. Uh, there is one more uh, question sir, um, from the ground. It's actually um, for Sumitra. Uh, actually, it's also applied to Colton, maybe later after Sumitra, if you have anything to add on. Huh? Based on your engagements, how were you able to empower small NGOs in improving access to digital skills training in both young and old to drive behavioral change towards equitable and inclusive growth? Can you cite some of your engagements? Uh, this question comes from Santa Gale. It's a good question, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think this is exactly why about about two years ago, and uh, you know, I'm a Malaysian in, uh, working with NGOs in ASEAN. Uh, it became very clear to really drive deep change, we're going to have to embrace uh, technology adoption. So we started looking at the program. So I think that practically speaking, uh, there are three things uh, that I think we can do. One is we need more partnerships like this one that we've had with Google.org. Uh, it's visionary and it um, transcends and reaches down to civil society. Uh, and it's great to have Colton here, so I'm glad Colton's also going to add the answer to this, to the second part to this. The second thing is to continue to connect to other organizations and social entrepreneurs that are strong in technology. And I, I'm vividly remembering here a social entrepreneur by the name of Akshay Saxena who runs Avanti Learning and Avanti Fellowship. And one of his key insights is we need more engineers. We need more technology literate leaders in the civil society to solve problems, to skill us, to drive change. So I think the second way is to reach out to the peer network within civil society 
that are clearly leaders in the field um, to learn from them as they're often open to sharing knowledge. He particularly, uh, Akshay Satsan now at Avanti Learning is building a platform and he's really inviting uh, more social entrepreneurs uh, to come to it. The third thing is um, reaching out to tech firms themselves that we have been very positively surprised uh, from the volunteering and, and mentoring process that um, many, many tech leaders, uh, tech employees are ready, willing and able to continue to support particularly small NGO uh, as they want to drive more purpose uh, for themselves as well as society. Um, Colton, would you like to add more? Sure. Um, I think the only thing that I would add is, that, as you rightly mentioned, taking advantage of, of those existing sources, um, but engaging the private sector. Many times, um, this is a source of overlooked um, um, value where um, private businesses have uh, resources available in terms of um, computer labs or computer access or taking in um, training in to, to occur in-house, um, which can in increase their oversight of, of the technical aspects of the training, um, as well as offering additional resources um, for technology access. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Colton and Sumitra, for answering the questions. So we are going to our last question, which I uh, will go to, I uh, will uh, direct this question to Maria first, and then can be added on by all the other panels. The question is, uh, people tend to be more aware of what their local community needs. What would the team of speakers suggest to individuals who have new ideas and plan to support their local community on first, where to start, and second, how to seek mentorship and support to develop the pilot uh, plan. So uh, I pass the uh, question to Maria first and later on the rest of the panels can add on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Young. It's a, it's a very good question. And I think that we were all in that situations where we asked ourselves where to start um, and how and who to reach out to in order to support different communities and especially those the most marginalized communities. Uh, I, will, I will start answering by saying that I was personally really inspired how during this pandemic, the whole society came together uh, to support and offer help with whatever they could do and whatever they could help with. Um, either that would be through volunteering, or giving, or funding, or just that simple act of kindness. Uh, we have, I have personally been very inspired and motivated how the whole society really came together during this pandemic. Um, what I have seen so far, and especially from the examples of, um, of from our grantees, the Asia Foundation and um, Ashoka, Pan International, the ASEAN Foundation, um, the power and the importance of partnerships, of reaching out to different organizations and finding out what is it that other organizations are doing and how different individuals or organizations could potentially add and contribute to that one for, um, for the greater impact. And finally, I will just highlight again, if you are part of the organization uh, and you're supporting women and girls in economic recovery, feel free to check out the go, uh, google.org impact challenge and, um, and, and see the uh, eligibility criteria and apply if uh, by April 10th. Hand over to you, Dr. Young. Yeah, uh, maybe some other uh, organization. Uh, Melanie, you want to add on to some? points for this? Uh, thank you, Dr. Young. Yeah, I would just say that I think, you know, going back to earlier what we talked about in terms of a really constructive and engaged partnership, and I think this year has shown us more than any year um, in my entire career that we've really had to really work together and, and communicate really 
you know, quite often. Um, not only have we had uh, an exceptional relationship with, with Google.org and, and all the folks at Google, as we started starting to map out what we wanted to do, where we wanted to go, um, but also making sure that we weren't bumping into uh, other areas that were already being well covered. And I think that was really important. And I can't emphasize enough the uniqueness of really reaching out to the formal ASEAN body and working with you know, ASEAN member states and their governments where they are also really uh, important uh, you know, advocates and um, collaborators on this whole approach. So I think in terms of how to start, I think the key is really open communication lines, engaging as much as possible. Um, and that when there are sticky spots that we, we stop and we, we talk about them and we, we sort it out together. Um, I think that's really been the nature of how we've been uh, working together uh, across the region on Go Digital ASEAN. So thanks for that. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe Sumitra, you want to have uh, give some advice for them how to they can start huh? because this is always the very challenging part. Take the first small baby step, whatever that might be. I think just just do it. Um, I think it always seems very overwhelming when things seem um, really large. Uh, that's what we learned last year. Overnight, we were going to do this lovely offline engagement in-person engagement. And we had to step into our fear and come online and create that magic space online. I think embracing that, and I'm grateful for partners who allow for us to experiment and to allow for that to happen. Um, but yeah, just go out there, take the first step, fail, uh, retry um, and, and keep going and it will get better. Mm, yeah, this is really inspiring. Yes, Mitra, I agree with you. Last year we were having problems on uh, during March. What shall we do? Now we are grounded, you know. So you have to take the baby steps. So maybe Cotton, you want to have the last say in this uh, questions before we end the Q and A session? Sure. Yeah, I think this is a great question, and I I think of it from uh, what we call a youth agency perspective. So um, there are so many young people who have these ideas, who have the drive, who have the energy, who know their communities um, and, and really don't know where to start, you know, as, as we're saying. So one, um, as others are saying, you really just do have to get out there. But the other is there is so much power in connecting with others, even if it's a small group of your peers, um, sharing your ideas, building energy. Um, Plan works a lot with with um, youth leaders and they continually say, I didn't know that I could do this until I was exposed to it. So just the idea of youth having um, the ability to make change for their communities is so powerful um, and connecting with them, with them with that information can do that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, thank you so much for all the panels and also for all the participants for your questions. Uh, actually, uh, from what I understand that uh, we can leverage uh, and take opportunity uh, to do what first step, baby steps, as what has been advised by the panel. Uh, now you have the technology in your hand. Yeah? So you have the audience in your hand also. Those days we have difficulties to reach people because people didn't want to come to the online platform to meet. So now people are willing to open up to see you in the virtual platform. So use this to your uh, benefit, you know, try yeah, baby steps. So I wish all of you uh, good luck. Huh? And then of course, uh, I also, also before I wrap up uh, today's session, let me have a special thank uh, to ADB Asian Development Bank for organizing this panel, very fruitful panels and sharing panels, and also Google yeah, for giving us all the opportunities, platforms and enablement yeah, to come together to share our experience and our volunteering spirits with all the people here. And for the participants, thank you for joining. And then also, I hope that you have learned something today yeah, and take home something with you. And there is some key points I want you to remember is Southeast Asia was hit early and hard by the pandemic, but we have seen incredible resilience and adaptability across the region. So it is, it is not the end of the world. You know, it is something, it's a beginning, yeah? it's a new journey. So I think that uh, we should actually leverage and take advantage of what is available right now. And we need to also make sure 
uh, government and also uh, in each of the countries in this region to actually make sure that their people are given the best infrastructure so that they can access uh, to digital world. So, um, and then also readiness of infrastructures, bridging the gap of digital divide and all that has to be solved uh, immediately. Yeah? So, uh, and then also to urge everyone to embrace the partnership spirit. Yeah? Partnership between governments, businesses and non-profit sector are the best way to close skill gaps and expand opportunity. So uh, regarding the employment crisis or so, please join some of our programs that we have shared this, uh, and then also some of the SMEs program with uh, Melanie, with Sumitra, Colton, you know, with Google Org. So uh, please keep an eye for the advertisement in the social platforms. Uh, be with us, join us. So uh, I will actually end this session for today. And uh, thank you once again to Google Org, ADB, Google, uh, Asia Foundation, uh, Plan International, and also Asuka. And have a good day, everyone. Thank you very much.